Today, our reading comes from Psalm. We are reading Psalm 23, such a familiar passage. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. May the Lord add a bleeding to may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. So you guys, I may be looking a little confused today, but my phone is talking to me. I really desire to hear the voice of the Lord, but I do not desire to hear my phone. So I'm going to ask today that somebody come and just grab my phone from me. For whatever reason, I've done all, I've knocked it down. It, it just, it keeps talking to me. So I want to talk to you. And I don't want my phone to talk to me, so thank you. Our sermonic theme for today is restoration has finally come. Restoration has finally come. This week, I finished a novel I had been reading, a historical fiction novel. Um, the title of this novel is The Mountain Sings. The Mountain Sings. It's actually named after a bird, and this bird's name means The Mountain Sings. This novel follows four generations of a Vietnam family through the war, which happened to have lasted from 1954 to 1975. Often as Americans, we only know the end of the Vietnam War, but it actually had started many years earlier. North Vietnam and South Vietnam were divided. The North wanted Vietnam to be a unified communist regime, similar to that of the, what was then known as the Soviet Union and China. However, the South wanted Vietnam to reflect more closely the West. So you have the Soviet Union and China supplying the North with artillery, and you have the US supplying the South. Well, you guys know that the US pulled out in 1973. And in 1975, the South, which was the side we were supporting, lost. They lost to a full-scale invasion by the North. But the human cost of this war. Two million civilians died over the course of this war. More than 1.1 million soldiers were lost on the North Vietnam side. The U.S. estimates, estimates that 250,000 soldiers from the South Vietnam side were lost. 57,939 soldiers were lost to the U.S. South Korea lost 4,000 soldiers, and Thailand and Australia and New Zealand also lost soldiers in this Vietnam War. And this book tells how this war impacted only one family broken one family, the absolute lowest that humanity could go with all kinds of killings and rape and cruelty. And yet at the very end of this book, there is hope for the next generation. I won't compare the Vietnam War to our present times, but I will say that we are living through a time that is challenging for us. We're living through a time period that has never been lived before. And I'm hearing the irony of that because any time we're living is a time we've never <laughs> lived before. I mean, if you want to put it that way. But when I say never lived before, we're living something of big proportions. We're living through or we are in the midst of a pandemic of such proportions that this will be written about in history books to come. 
While most pandemics have been in certain regions, this pandemic has gone all over the world. We are experiencing a health crisis. We are experiencing an attack right here in the United States of America. And Illinois, out of all 50 states, is in fourth place for the number of cases that have been reported. Seniors are staying at home and the youth are having parties, both responding with age-appropriate behavior. We're trying to follow the advice of our elected officials and our medical leaders. We're getting reports every day from our governor and our mayor. Two days ago, it went into effect that now when we enter public places in the state of Illinois, we are to wear masks. Also, the governor is allowing religious folks to gather as long as it's under 10 per people. But just to be on the safe side, you all stay at home, because I wouldn't know which 10 to allow to come to church. <laughs> Some states are doing a soft opening. I was listening to the news in over 50 states this weekend or in the next couple of days will be starting to opening up their businesses opening their business supposedly to save our economy, which some people are very worried about. Worried to the point where there's protesting going on, even as close as Michigan. Social distancing is still important, even when we open back up. Pandemic experts say that if we get a hold of this, we might do okay, but they are looking for a second wave, a bigger wave, in the fall of this year, with one to follow in the winter of 2021. Some areas have been less hit, while others like New York are so far ahead, they're digging burial places for the large overflow of bodies. And there are promises of a vaccine, but we don't know when that vaccine will come. We know that globally, people are working to find a vaccine that will definitely be a hallelujah from all of us. Even when we try not to talk about COVID-19, sometimes I get on the phone with my friends and I'm like, we're not talking about COVID-19 today. We still end up somehow drifting to something because no matter how much distance we try to put between ourselves in this pandemic, we still are very much connected to COVID-19. But we move and we have our being as followers of Christ with a hope like the character in the novel, a hope for our future and for our next generation. Today in our text is another voice, a voice that emerges out of a group of people that have experienced hard time. The Israelites were no small feat to suffering. It also seems like their living was synonymous with hard times. Life was challenging for the Israelites. This passage is a praise to God for delivering them through life-threatening situations. As typical with the psalm, there's a petition. There's a real lament. That means someone's crying, someone's in pain, followed by trust and praise. What I am fond of in the psalm is that people keep it 100 real. They're honest about what they're going through. They're honest about how they feel. They don't mix words. There's mention in this particular psalm of dark valleys and enemies. If one peeks back over into Psalm 22, there is real lament that is going forth from the Israelites in this psalm. There are implications here that life can take us to dark valleys. Life can be hard. Life can push you. Life can press you. Life can even sometimes break us. We can be broken by life. And if you ever needed proof of that, all you have to do is step outside of our church and look at some soul on a step. While humans are wonderfully resilient, we also are tragically fragile. And we find ourselves sometimes one demon away from losing our mind and sitting in the dark night of our soul. And yet our hands and our heart and our spirit extend to this hope that is present here in the Psalms. Even though I'm going through, I will fear no evil, which says evil is present. 
Even though I am going through right now, my God is with me. Even though these are challenging times, you are my rod and my staff. I don't have to want for anything. My grass, not my neighbor's, my grass is green. And haters, check it out. God's going to prepare a table of plenty. My cup runneth over. Goodness and mercy are following me. The other day I was driving here in Hyde Park and it seemed like every turn I made with my car, this car made a turn. I started to feel a little bit paranoid. I would make a turn, this car would make a turn. So I was driving down towards Cottage Grove and I said, if he makes a turn with me this time, I know this person is following me. Well, thanks be to God, I made the turn and the car <laughs> went on its way. But it reminds me that goodness and mercy are going to follow us, just like it appeared that car was following me. The writer declares here, goodness and mercy will follow you to Cottage Grove. It will follow you in the valley. It will stay on your heels. As much as I love that passage, there's one I love more. It's in verse 3. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Restore means to return to a former condition, a place, or a position. To repair or renovate. So as you return it to what it used to look like when you first got it. We live in a world where our souls are continually being depleted and where bad news is the only news. We are being bombarded with negative messages. We are seeing our country more divided than it's ever been. COVID-19 is just one more manifestation of how divided we are. We listen to friends and loved ones struggling. If not, we're struggling ourselves. Even though we are staying at home, more gun violence rings out across our city. It's important that our souls are nourished and fed and restored. We are in need of soul restoration. As the kids would say, seriously, seriously. This past weekend, one of my friends a member of the church by distance who lives down in the South, Mia Whiting Thompson, took up the offer to do some work on a friend of hers house. She said she had been laid off for work, so when this friend called up and said, will you do some work on my house, she was willing to do it. Now, I looked at the house, and I had a few thoughts about what should be done with the house, like maybe setting a match and burning it down. <laughs> but she decided... <laughs> to go on in and help out. She power washed it, lifting layers and layers of dirt off the house. She repaired the steps to the house. She repainted the house. She's able to get in there and take something that looks like it should go straight to the garbage and make it look beautiful again. For example, this teapot. I don't know if you're seeing the teapot or not, but she went to a rummage sale and bought this tea part that was black and varnished. And again, for me, looks like something I would have left in the used shop. But she takes it home and she varnishes it and she works with it and she restores it. You see, she's able to see the beauty in things that have been neglected, the beauty in things that have experienced wear and tear. I'd like to think of God in Psalm 23 like that. When the sex says that God restores our soul, God repairs and God renovates. God gives us a power wash and God repaints. And God varnishes and God polishes and God causes us to shine. And that's how we sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. God restores us. In these times, it's important for us to be restored. So I buy a lot of toilet paper. And I did that even before COVID-19. 
COVID-19 didn't come along and I decided I was going to buy a lot of toilet paper. I just buy toilet paper in bulk because I don't know about you, but it's one of those things that you seem to just run out of quickly. I mean, like you're not counting and then one day you're like, you know, <laughs> I don't have any toilet paper. So I like to buy in bulk. And that's the privilege of having a job. Whenever I buy toilet paper, I just go to one of these warehouses. I get 32 rolls so I don't have to think about it. I can run out of roll after roll after roll and still have toilet paper. It takes the guesswork out of it. I love that. I love replenishing and having things on the shelf so that I don't have to always be remembering I got to get this. And yet I think of restoring our soul similarly. What would it look like spiritually if we always had certain things on our shelves? If we always had a scripture that we could quote? If we always had a song that we could sing? If we always had a prayer life and went down on our knees every day? If we always had spiritual disciplines? If we always have these things that our soul need because it's better to need and not have than to have, did I say that right? I'm starting to get messed up in my head, but you get where I'm going with this. Just figure it out. It's better to have something and not need it than to need, I got it, and not have. It's good to have spiritual discipline. It's good to have a prayer life. These things are important. Spiritual practices like never before are important so that we don't one day going through life wake up and realize we're out of toilet paper. We try to do everything else to avoid it, but spending time with God is one of the best investments we can make in keeping our soul restored. Even today, worship is part of that restoration. Gathering together in our homes is part of that restoration. And remember, after service today, you can join us for coffee hour, so we'd love to have you. We are basically being told in this text today to trust God, to trust God. Not just to trust God with restoring our soul, but trust God to be with us, to trust God with our wants, to trust God to walk with us, to trust God to handle our enemies, to trust God to get us through whatever we're facing. Trust God. In the world of team building, they have these different exercises where teams can go away and they can work on their relationship and they can work on being a stronger team. I like to think of us united as a team and God is on our team. At these team building exercises, one of them they have is called trust. And in the trust building exercise, you are asked to turn your back to your colleague, and after a series of statements, you are supposed to fall backward into your colleague's arms. This exercise can be hard. It can be made hard by the own obstacles in our head, like, can they catch me? Are they, you know, all that stuff that we kind of do in our head. We don't just fall back into people's arms, not even when it's God. Sometimes trusting God can be hard. Oh, we talk a good talk. We really talk a good talk. We know the religious language. We know the Bible scriptures. But when it really comes down to it, trusting God to lean and to fall back and to catch us, to put all of our cares to the side and to trust that God will catch us. It's a tremendous feeling after you do the exercise, after you trust that that person will catch you, and you fall back and they catch you. When we cry, God is there for us. The text is saying today, when we fall, God is there to catch us. When we are going through, God is there for us. When we are scared, God is there for us. Right now in this pandemic, God is there. When we throw our hands up in the air, God is there for us. When we are in the storm, God wants to encourage our soul. God even wants to restore our soul. On 9-11, almost every American citizen knows exactly what they were doing. I remember it like it was yesterday. 
when our country once again was shocked and halted to a state of unbelief. One church in the city of New York convened a service that evening and people piled in. The church was full, full of believers and people that didn't know what they believe and people that knew they didn't believe. They all piled into the church, their traumatized bodies to sit in a church hoping, hoping beyond hope that what had happened wasn't real. They were still very much in a state of shock. They gathered, as we often do, for some word of reassurance or glimmer of hope. They were there and they sat. And in that context, and on that evening of 9-11, someone read from Psalm 23. Today in Sunday school, I learned that not only did they quote this in 9-11, not only is it our text today and it seems so appropriate for the pandemic, but that often when people are going through and are struggling and are on the verge, when people are transitioning and on the threshold, Psalm 23 is where they turn. Trust God. I'd like to end here reading Psalm 23 from a different translation written by the message. We're used to hearing the NRSV, but I thought today, and we're used to the King James Version, because even though we read the NRSV, I remember it in the King James. Today, I want you to hear it from the message, a scripture that has comforted and consoled so many, so many people throughout the world. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crop, crook, your, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessings. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Amen. <laughs>